Well, hello there, everybody. It is... It is indeed Saturday, and you know what that means? It's time for some fucking D&D. Holy shit. I've been waiting so long for this. So very long. <sighs> so, uh, yeah. Uh, hey, everyone. So, we're playing D&D today. D&D 2.0. It's a custom game made by... Made by Graham over here. He's our new DM. Uh... And as always, we have Max here. He's he's coming back. We go through these DMs so often. I know, I know. We will find a good one. Hopefully, Graham will be the good one. So far, right. he's been exceptional. Uh, just just a heads up to everyone who's going to be watching us. Uh, after after the show ends tonight, uh, we have a pre-recorded uh, camp uh, character creation. Uh, that is going to be live on the YouTube channel. Uh, it is actually about four hours long. So you don't have to watch it unless you really want to. I'm probably going to put some annotations in there so people can skip around to certain parts during the actual process. But uh, the character creation for this game is particularly interesting because uh, our character backstory decide, like, kind of defined what type of characters we're going to be in this show. And for the most part, a lot of it was rolled up. Uh, including character stats, including uh, character names, including, uh, you know, what we right. actually are. So, Worst. yeah. Worst. I got the worst name ever. Yeah. Well, you know, that happens sometimes. I think I'm, wor <laughs> I'm going to work with it. It's going to be amazing, but I got the worst name. <laughs> so um, I'll just go around and introduce everyone. Uh, we have Max. He's going to be playing Oral. Um and we have myself, we're going to play Walza, and uh, we won't give too much away other than that. And then last but not least, we have uh, Graham, our wonderful DM. Uh, so that's everyone. Graham, uh, why don't you explain what it is this game is and uh, what changes you've made from the... or what, what, what sort of changes we can expect from the original formula of D&D? &D? Um... Well, D&D &D, uh, 2nd Edition is kind of, if you guys are only familiar with 3.5 or 3rd Edition, um, the way the rules are written, there are less die involved. And uh, specifically for this game, that's even more, that's even more uh, true. It's kind of based on, it's really, this game specifically is engineered so that the characters are really the focus of it and character growth is kind of the point and the kind of the end goal is that the characters uh, kind of learn and grow you know within this frame story of this uh, this contrivance of an adventure um, uh, as far as changes go I I feel like the changes will come about just as we play you'll kind of see what's different if you're familiar with 2e it won't be that much different but if you're, if you're only familiar with 3.5 then it's going to be very different, and just kind of see how it goes, because it's it's not too hard to follow, and I think it's they're good changes. So it's kind of all right. And uh, the world itself is this a a custom one that you've made? Oh yeah, are you going to put up that uh, that campaign description? Yeah, I'll uh, I'll have it up somewhere. Um, it'll be available probably in the actual like YouTube video itself. Um, so that's can we have a Google Docs maybe we could link everyone to? So Actually, can... you know what? That would probably work too. Um, I don't think I have anything on hand at the moment, but we'll definitely have something after the show that people can read if they, if they want to know more. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so... Essentially, yeah. The, the only thing people really need to know is that... Um, are, they, are they saying this picture? Uh, what picture is that? In Roll20, are they no, seeing they're, that? No, they're not seeing that. They're only seeing the... Uh, on, on a related note, an invitation to Roll20 would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> is it the Eye of the Raven and the Wrath of the Minotaur? Is that's that the, the one? one. Yeah, that's the one, dude. Okay. Okay. Then I don't need your stinking invitation. <laughs> <laughs> you were in here for CC, man, so you already should have all that stuff. So. Yeah. I was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Where I rolled like a little... monster and then allocate it poorly. <laughs> All right, uh, Graham, as you were, what were you saying? So essentially, this um, territory is is 
kind of like a county in, as far as size is concerned. Um, and uh, colloquially, it's referred to as, as the veil. Um, and the veil consists of, it's basically, it's, it's roughly square. Uh, and there are several settlements in the Vale, and um, the only thing we really need to know is the unofficial mayor of this uh, area, the Vale, is one halfling named Boswell Thistleboroughs, and he sent an open invitation to anybody who was interested uh, to investigate a, a, a tower on the fringes of uh, the Black Forest of Mortimer, which is what the uh, forest is called. In the very south, it borders the Vale to the south. And, um, yeah, I'm just going to kind of go into it, and then when we, when we meet your characters, I'm going to have you describe little one-sentence backstories and what they look like. Yeah. Okay. So you have been invited to this uh, home of the unofficial mayor. Uh, of the Vale, and I say unofficial because the Vale is controlled by the, by the city of Thunderonis and the royal family of Thunderonis, and uh, specifically Lord Waldron presides over this, this area, but he really doesn't do a lot of hands-on uh, ruling. He really only cares about his scholars' college and his priests and the other settlements of the Vale remain ignored as far as uh, guard members, militia, uh, you know, funds, food, all that kind of stuff. And so the Vale is kind of left up to this halfling, Boswell Thistleboroughs, to continue to run and for the people to continue to survive. And so none of them pledge any particular allegiance to Lord Waldron. And, uh, and so that's why... Okay. He's kind of the ruler. That's why he's the ruler. Um, Thistleboroughs lives in an ornate, beautifully crafted wooden home, very rustic, in the southern portion of the Vale, along the road. Um, the home exists in the hill country. The center of the Vale, the, even though the road is more of a square, the, in, the center is the it's hill country and very, very rough. There's no roads that go through there. And um, it's very, very, it's wooded and it is hilled. And, and they've traveled, the party members, or these two, have traveled along the East Road to get to this manor house in order to see what Thistleboroughs needs done, uh, specifically this tower that needs to be seen at two. And so they, they arrive there. There is a hitching post flush with the road for putting up a horse that they don't have. A side building appears to be a stable with three horses. A groomsman is shoveling hay out of the stable. You see a lovely grove of trees behind the home, several flower and garden beds out front. There is a cobblestone walkway up to the front steps. The home is two stories with slate roof, stone chimney, and a large porch which spans the length, or rather the, uh, the perimeter of the home. Okay. There are two front-facing windows on the ground. Are there? Do we see any people? Are you cleaning something? I yeah. am. I'm totally eating right now. <laughs> okay. There are two front-facing windows on the ground floor and one long window on the top floor. The home is in very fine repair and is welcoming. A squat stone well stands alone to the left. Let's say I was in the home. If I looked out at this moment, who would I see standing on the walkway? Uh, well... <clears throat> I guess. What would, what would I see? Describe it physically what your character looks like. All right. Well, um, you first you would see a sort of I guess a a much larger man and a uh, smaller man walking alongside each other. Uh, the the taller man is sort of a lot. He he's well built and for the most part he doesn't seem to have a lot of possessions with him. Uh, you can, I mean, there is there is something protruding off his back for the most part. Um, he doesn't he doesn't have a lot of hair. He's mostly he's mostly shaved down to the skin for the most part. Um, uh, his facial hair is stubble from traveling, and um, 
he, he seems kind of uh, well-worn in, in terms of uh, how much... He, he looks like a working man, basically. And oh. uh, Max... Cal Callous tan, sun-baked tan, perhaps. Well, not so much tan, more like, sort of like, if he was wearing... If he was wearing, like, a protective mask or anything like that, he would kind of have, like, from, you know, fumes and stuff like that, he would be... He'd be sort of be sunburnt in, like, like how workers would be sunburnt, like truckers would be sunburnt on their arms and that sort of stuff. So he's got a very sort of, I'm always wearing the same uniform, but it's well-worn sort of look to him. Um, and but does, does he look honest or does he have a shifty appearance about him? Uh, he, he does look honest, yeah. He looks like he's, he's, uh, he's here for the right reasons. And he... Yeah, he he seem he seems to be sort of uh, eyes agape, sort of experiencing everything he can as he comes into the town. So, what what kind of uh, belongings, slim though they may be, does he have with him? He seems to have uh, a backpack uh, and and a long weapon that he can't they can't really see from that distance, I guess. Sure, um, that's fine. Mm. And. Uh, and then, what about the person next to him, the smaller man? What, is, what does he look like? Ah, okay. I'm assuming this is my character? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. So, sending off to the left, he sees a another another man, st striking resemblance, resemblance to the first. Oh, yes. Not quite, not quite as tall, but in the face, it's very, very similar. Uh, but he's skinnier. He seems to be... He looks like... That that strange weapon on the other man's back probably looks like he wouldn't he wouldn't want to or might not even be able to pick it up. Uh, his his slick brown hair is, is down and low. Well, he has brown eyes, although they wouldn't be able to see this. Uh, and he's he seems to be more or less surveying the area, talking to the other person, and just seems to be kind of shifting about, looking looking for anything that might be an opportunity. Does it look conspicuous per se? But he's he's definitely seems to be more focused on potential in the area. If that makes any sense. Dude. On his sorry, sorry, you're good. On his uh, on his back is a backpack. Uh, above that and tied in a bundle is a is a cheap tent. Although not necessarily that they'd be able to see that it was such a cheap tent. <laughs> Truly, it is a piece of garbage. Uh, <laughs> barely, barely. <laughs> Fairly fit to keep the wind off, much less the water. Yeah. Uh, tied in a bundle on his pack. Um, and there's small pouches at his belt line, and he, uh, he's carrying what seems to be a very, very small thin dagger at his hip. But they don't really know. I mean, there could be a dagger anywhere else. They don't really know. But what they can see is a small, almost, almost obscenely small dagger at his hip. Uh, if I if if I were to watch you to walk up the path, what would I what would I be able to um, define about your rapport with each other? Um, are you walking far apart? Are you walking side by side, one after the other? I have a question for you then. How far was the was the travel from where we started? Uh, from where you started, um, day uh, a day and change. So okay, it's so uh, not mid, much. At this time, it's mid morning before so, lunch time. So I guess during the, the travel, uh, we would have been we would have been you know getting acquainted with each other once again after a long hiatus. And, yeah, that's a good segue. Uh, Why don't you talk about uh, backstory a little bit uh, between okay. the two of you? Why don't you talk? Uh, give me a give me a little paragraph about uh, what happened, and just for the sake of of watching, they these two are our brothers, twin, twins, as it so happens. Yeah. Yeah. Um, while we're doing that, Max, do you want to just refresh your cam? On Skype? Yeah. It's uh it's actually on on Skype. We yeah, have... it's just frozen on my end, so you'll need to just I'm gonna uh, drop out and join back in the call. Yeah, fast. sure, no worries. Uh all right, so uh, so Walza uh for the most part was uh raised uh to be a very honest child. Uh he he grew up uh loving and in admiring armor and weapons. Um, and that's kind of where he led to be his uh, led into his adult life being a blacksmith and a weaponsmith. 
And uh, that's where he finds most of his passion. But lately, he, uh, he's got the, the urge to go out and actually use the weapons and armor that he has been lovingly crafting for most of his adult life. And that's, that's where he got the inspiration to join up with the uh, with uh, Thistle Bros and his sort of adventure that he has planned. My turn? Yep. An orc also called, also called Jack, I think, right? Yeah. Yes. So, Oral growing up was more of a... Uh, Repscallion. God, I get to use the word Repscallion. It's lovely. <laughs> uh, he didn't didn't so much appreciate authority around him. He appreciated the wisdom of anyone around him, but only if it could help him, you know, fetch fetch the lovely dame down the street or in some way put put a coin in his pocket. So he grew up most of his time was spent running around getting into all sorts of trouble and small small scraps around in the t- in the city that they grew up in uh, necessarily hang with his brother particularly tightly but but it was nice to have a strong arm when you needed somebody who uh, turned out to be, throw a harder punch you know to really be taken down a peg mm. uh, as they grew up and uh, he got a little older he uh, found a instrument in the trash and became a bit of a musician. Uh, so he spent most, much of his 17s just kind of pretty much plying the trade of being a musician, being a musician around town for drink and rooms and, and stays at local inns until one night uh, he noticed a, a particularly fetching woman place a whole silver piece. And for anyone who's watching, a whole silver piece is a big deal in the world we're currently in. Um, or was it a gold piece? I don't. It was, it was, it was, you're right. It was a silver piece. Yeah. It was silver. Okay. So, a whole silver piece, which was a lot of money for him, into his case, and he's like, "Dad, that's a great score." And at the end of the night, no silver piece. Oh, someone must have swiped it. Maybe I missed saw. And next night, he's playing in the same woman. This happens again. And different bar. Was, different different bar. Different bar. Same woman though. That's odd playing into the night you know looks in nope no silver piece he was positive he he'd seen her place one in so this goes on two or three more nights until finally uh he confronts her and leans down as she goes to put the piece in and says well let's stay in there tonight you know and she slyly winks at him and seems to drop the piece directly into the case and turns and walks away and Sure enough, end of the night, it's not there. So the next night, different bar. There she is, and as soon as she starts to slip away, he politely packs up and follows. Turns out that uh, falls. Uh, she's a member of the Thieves Guild, and so she gives him a challenge that, through sleight of hand and with trickery, that he must try to make... She gives him one silver coin uh, on a string, funny enough, uh, and gives him a challenge that through sleight of hand and trickery he must come back to her with at least ten. It takes him a long time, but he, he plies the trade and he gets a little better at it. And eventually comes back with his ten ill-gotten goods, gains rather, mm. and uh, somewhat initiated into the Thieves' Guild of the local area. And then through his own silliness, uh, somewhat ostracized, or alienates himself from them to the extent that it would be beneficial to leave the city for a while. And that brings us here with him needing to not necessarily always be gone, but for now, being a really smart idea to just not be there. And hey, he hears that his brother is setting out on a wonderful adventure. Might as well go along and keep his brother out of trouble. (laughs) Or into okay. trouble, yeah. Or into. <laughs> and so you two are standing there with your uh, scarce uh, supplies, and you see this. You see a, this wonderful manor house, well stables with a, a groomsman shoveling hay uh, outward, and uh, you know this is the this is the place. Uh, no other houses for miles. It's the only house with an orchard out back. And so you know this is kind of uh, where you're supposed to go. When when you when you agree to the messenger, when you agree to 
come and undertake this uh, this kind of task. He wrote ahead and, and told the Zoboros you'd be coming, and so he, that you are expected. So uh, what happens next? Uh, what, what do you what do you do? Uh, well, I guess I make my way up the porch. Uh, do I have the name of the messenger? Um, uh, yeah. Right. Um, we'll say, um, Mortimer, yeah. Mortimer? Mortimer. Mortimer, okay. Alright, I, uh, rap at the door. And I wait patiently, yeah. Alright. And I'll, uh, then I rap right. again. I'll say <laughs> yeah. That's fine. Uh, a man opens the door. He says, he seems a bit surprised. Oh, what's this? He looks out of the home. Uh, 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 good day. Uh, can, I, can, I, can I help you? Uh, <clears throat> yes. Uh, <clears throat> trying to put on a deep voice here. <laughs> we'll see how we go with this. Uh, you while. see that the man is of average height. You're actually uh, basically on on proportion with him, like as far as height and weight are concerned. He's not particularly strong, but he is, uh, he's not particularly uh, fat, nor tall, nor short. Okay, so it's average then, yeah. Um, we, uh, <clears throat> we, we got your message about wanting, uh, uh, people to come look at some tower or something, and, uh, there was a messenger uh, by the name of Mortimer or something like that, I don't know, uh, he, uh, he was, he was riding ahead to let you know that we were coming, and, uh, Hey, we're here. So, uh, uh what's the uh, what's the man wearing? Oh, uh, you see, the man is wearing a magenta dyed linen linen shirt, uh, dark breeches, black leather shoes with brass buckles. His sleeves are rolled up to his elbows, and uh, you see that he has a kind of long brown hair tied in a ponytail with a a black ribbon. Okay. And he. he Oh, sorry. Yeah, he doesn't look too imposing, though, right? So. No, certainly not. He. But he does. He does look fancy, correct? He he seems to be dressed in finer clothes than you may be used to, or you, either of you may be used to. Okay. Um, I look at him, waiting for a response as I sit yeah, down. Yeah, he says, uh, "Please come in." He he pulls off a pair of thick gloves. Okay. And he kind of shoves them in his in the back of his pants. Please come in, and he, he waves his or kind of draws his hands uh, into the home and. Steps aside. I like, uh, I like sort of try and kick the mud and gack off the bottom of my boots at, onto his front porch, and then I make my way inside. Yes, uh, Master Boswell has been expecting you. He has talked nonstop about this ruined tower. Um, and uh, do you both, uh, Oral as well, goes in? Yes, yeah, I follow. I follow. Okay. The interior of the home is all hardwood. A dark green rug with gold trim spans the foyer. You can see four rooms from the entrance hall, none of which have doors. It's very open in here, very spacious. You can see there's a food preparatory area, a dining room with a dining table that's very fine. It's made out of a single uh, huge pane of glass. Um, you see a room with couches and coffee table, a, a drawing room perhaps, and then a a, a room that appears to be a smoking room. Uh, now, none of these things are particularly common among the lower classes, and so uh, these rooms may may appear, you know, uh, an ancillary. All right. So I walk in. I kind of like eyeball everything. It's, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's mighty fine in here. Like, <laughs> I walk up. So I walk up and I uh, sort of, is there anything on the walls at all? Like any sort of, uh, anything I can look at, touch, prod? Uh, yeah, well, actually there are some, uh, some, actually right on the inside, uh, next to you on our either side, or I guess on the left side, and the door opens outward, or inward. On the left side, when you walk in, there's a, you know, a small table with a candlestick on it, snuffer. Okay. Uh, you see that on the, on the left side of the, this, house. Uh, there are large, two large windows, uh, one on each of the two rooms, the smoking room and the dining area, and then once again on the right side in the drawing room, another large window. Okay. Um, but the, the but it's very open, and there is, uh, there's no chandelier in this in this foyer, but actually you do see another man, an, an armored man, and he's got what appears to be two swords strapped to the left side of his body. Alright. 
Uh, he's, oh, kinda, wow. he's kinda looking at you just as a he's, he appears to be a you know a guard, a, a higher higher hand. Alright, so I, I, I walk up to the guy and like I put my hand out. Walzer, what be you? And he says he kind of uh he folds his arms before they were behind his back and he he'll shake your hand. Yeah. Says Jonathan, what's it to you? Ah, it's just inspecting what you're wearing, sir. It looks well built. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, uh, how long have you had had the armor that you're wearing? This armor, I uh, had it made up in uh, Baysmore. Three years, two. Ah, it fits you well. And then kind of, kind of looks you up and down, a little bit confused. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I uh, used to be uh, a blacksmith, and uh, these sorts of things kind of interest me. You know, I see it, and oh, I, I see it. yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, still looking to uh, to sort of apply what I've been making um, into something a little bit more, you know. Something a little bit more adventurous, and uh, I've never really sort of built armor uh, that sort of protects like yours does. I mean, mine mostly are just like, you know, leather and chain and... What type of uh, plate was he wearing? Was it, was it? You see this is chainmail. Chainmail, oh, okay. Yeah. Alright. Um, as, as, so I'm always looking to uh, sort of expand what I know about this, and... Uh, it's, it's quietly, it's quite well crafted. So, just wanted to <laughs> give you a compliment. Don't take it any other yeah, way. Nice. He'll, he'll put his hand out again. And he says, "Well met." <laughs> well met indeed. I like, yeah. Uh, shake his hand again. Uh, at that point, he looks, he looks, uh, he looks past you at, at Oral, at the other man coming in, eyeing him with, uh, you know, suspicious. See, as he, he said, there, came you up. said there was a uh, table in the room, right? Yeah, uh, right. There's kind of an end table that's been set next to the door with a candle, with a candlestick, as well as a snuffer. Okay, I guess as I uh, as I walk in, I kind of just run my hand across it, kind of lift it up and look if there's any dust on it. See, if there's none. Just kind of peruse, examine the candle. Uh, snuffer. Yeah, the man who answered the door has closed it again, and he sees you doing that. And he says, he kind of sees you do that. Uh, your uh, house is well kept. He says, uh, it's not my, not my house. Mm. Oh, you're not uh, Thistle Bros then? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, Master, Master Boswell has been, uh, has been expecting you. He's in the study. Please, follow me. Oh, okay. Of course. And sort of trot after him. Okay. All right. Um, so you come along, uh, basically along... The green rug, all the way across the room, past the four rooms that I've described. Straight ahead, 50 feet. Uh, there's a 10 foot high set of double doors. The double doors have polished brass handles and brass, um, you know, paneling. And the the panels of the door appear to bear the symbol of a knot, a knotted rope, held by a fist. Um, the man who opened the door. Um, walks in front of you over to the door and says, uh, my name is Byron, uh, at your service, manservant to uh, Master Boswell Thistleboroughs of the Vale. He says, uh, I'll, I'll announce you, though I'll need your names and uh, titles. Uh, titles. <laughs> mm. I like scratch my chin a little bit and it's like, so anything we say, you, you'll announce us as? Well, uh, well, earned, earned, of course. Oh, I, I kind of look a little, like, a little <laughs> sad at that. I was like, oh, uh, I guess, uh, hang on, let me get my actual name here. I know it's in here somewhere. 